You know, I don't know about you, from, for, but for myself, from my, the time of my earliest memories about Christmas, it was, um, it was the anticipation of, what am I going to get for Christmas? What, what am I getting this year for Christmas? And I was always hoping that, that uh, when you open that gift, it would be exactly what you wanted. Have you ever th thought about, where, why do we do that? Where did that all start? Where, where does that come from? Um, some think that it's a reminder of the wise men. You know, when the wise men came, they brought gifts to Jesus, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, which we learned the other night is, you know, good smelling stuff, right? And uh, uh, others think that it's to signify the, the gift of Jesus Christ that God gave us through his, through his son that he sent to our world. You know, others think it's, uh, it's Santa Claus uh, swooping down from the North Pole to distribute gifts to the children. And, uh, and so forth. And, you know, there's a, there's a theology of Santa Claus and there's a theology of, of Jesus. And, you know, if we think about the theology of Santa Claus a little bit, uh, there's been songs written, written about both. And you think about Santa Claus, you know, as little kids we start hearing this song and probably everybody knows it. Oh, you better watch out. You better not cry, you better not pout, I'm telling you why, Santa Claus is coming to town. He's making a list, he's checking it twice, going to find out who's naughty or nice, Santa Claus is coming to town. You know, we teach our kids that, and um, you know, you better be good or Santa Claus won't bring you anything. Um, you know, he sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows when you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. So the idea is you better be good or Santa won't bring you a present. I saw this one Facebook, what do they call them? Memes, memes, you call them? There's little pictures on Facebook the other day. It said, uh, Santa, I've been really good this year. Well, mostly good. Oh, never mind, I'll buy my own presents. <laughs> so that's kind of what we grow up with. Um, you know, you got to be good or you won't get a present for Christmas, right? Well, what about songs about Jesus? There's lots of songs written about Jesus. How about this one? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. You know the rest of it. How about that one? A totally different concept, right? I want to talk to you this morning about the greatest gift ever given to mankind. Jesus Christ himself. Now, if we took this Bible, we took all the verses in this Bible, and just imagine you throw all the verses into this huge imaginary funnel, and all the verses would trickle down through this funnel, and there'd be one verse that would come out, one verse that would encapsulate this whole Bible from cover to cover. You all know the verse. It's John 3.16. If you look at your notes, I've got it in your notes here. Let's just, let's all read this or recite this together this morning, shall we? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. I want to take that verse, and I just want to pick that verse apart this morning. Every word in that verse, we're going to look at every word in that verse and see what that verse really means. Because I think sometimes we just, oh, as little kids, we learn that verse, and we just re learn to recite that verse, and, and we don't really get the meaning of what that verse means really means. So let's look at the first two words in there. For God. For God. Well, who is this God? Who is this God? He's the creator of the universe. The stars that are too many to count. Planets that we're still discovering. I just saw this uh, video on Facebook. I think it was this morning somebody had shared this video that you know, comparing our earth, our, uh, the place where we live, to the universe. And how very, very small and tiny our earth really is when you compare it to the galaxies in the universe that they're still discovering, they're still discovering whole galaxies out there with billions and billions of stars. It's that God. 
that God, that amazing, um, that amazing God, the creator of the universe, the God that caused it to rain 40 days and 40 nights, and you know, we can look outside and say, well, maybe he's doing it again. But um, the God that parted the Red Sea and the Jordan River, the God that sent manna from heaven every day, made water come from a rock, the God that sent a chariot of fire to pick up Elijah and take him up into heaven. It's that God. And I believe we're all created to have some understanding of God. Even people that have never really heard about this God have some understanding that there's some being that needs to be worshipped out there, right? There's something that needs, there's, it's kind of an instinct, kind of like birds flying south. They just kind of automatically do it. You don't have to teach a bird to fly south. They just, they do it. And uh, we're kind of that way. We have this inner understanding that there is a God. Now some try to deny it, but it's still there. And they worship something. Um, nature, themselves, material possessions. There's always something that everyone is worshiping. But this God, this God, he's the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the infinite, the all-powerful, the all-knowing God. That's the God he's talking about here. For God, the next phrase, so loved. So loved. Now, God could have just turned away and said, these people have turned their backs on me. I'm going to turn my back on them. He could have gone somewhere else in that vast universe out there and gone to another planet out there and started another race. He could have just started over. He could have done that. But it says he chose not to. His love. God's love is a perfect love. It's not, it's not a love like we have. Too many times our love is like what's in it for me. I'll love you if you love me back. What's in it for me? What can I get out of this relationship? That's not the kind of love that God has. It's not a love that says you've got to clean yourself up and then, and then I will love you. It's not the Santa Claus type of love. He's got a list, checking it twice, going to find out who's naughty or nice. He loves. He loves you right where you are. No matter what you've done, whether you've been naughty or nice, it's unconditional. These verses in Romans bring that out. It says, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While the world was still steeped in sin, God sent his son. Christ died for us. That's true love. That's true love. And then it says, For God so loved the world. The world. And most often in the Bible, when the Bible uses the term world, it means people. It's not the earth. It's not rock and dirt and water. It's every person on this great planet. It doesn't matter what race or ethnic group or social status or that you are, none is exempt from God's love. The greatest saint or the worst sinner or the worst terrorist or anything in between. John 1 29 says, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He wasn't talking about mountains. He wasn't talking about rocks and dirt. They don't sin, but people do. When he said he takes away the sin of the world, he's talking about everyone, everyone on this earth. Then it says that he gave. There's the gift. The gift. A gift. It's free. It's not something you have to earn or work for. You know, if someone gives you a gift, they will not accept payment for it, will you? How, how many of you... How many of you, when you got your gift on Christmas Day, uh, you said, oh, you shouldn't have. Let me pay you for this. <laughs> Any of you do that? If you pay for it, it ceases to be a gift, right? It's no longer a gift. You've bought it. You've paid for it. But God, it says he gave. But we do that all the time with God, don't we? We try to earn our salvation. 
Every other religion on earth is about earning their salvation, doing more good than bad, hoping, hoping that your good deeds will outweigh your bad deeds when you get to God's imaginary scale in the sky, that somehow you'll have more good deeds than bad deeds and God will let you into heaven. That's all religions in the world except Christianity, and it is even snuck into Christianity. If I just do enough Hail Marys, if I just follow certain rules and rit rituals, if I go to church and I'm baptized and I'm good and I don't mess up too bad, or, or maybe if I just hide it from the pastor, if the pastor doesn't find out what I'm really like, then I'll be good. <laughs> Let me tell you, you can't surprise me with anything anymore, all right? I've heard it all. <laughs> I've heard it all, all right? Ephesians. 2.8 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves. It is the gift. The gift of God. It's a gift. He wants to give it to you. The question is, are you willing to take it? Let me tell you a story. There's a young man, a young family in Europe back in the early 1900s that wanted to come to America. They didn't have much money, but they heard about all the great things happening in America, and so they wanted to come to America. And so um, they got all their money together, and they had just had enough for the husband to buy a ticket on a steamship going to America. So they decided that the wife and the kids would stay at home, and he would travel to America and get a job. Once he's established and makes some money, he would, he would go back and get the, get the rest of the family and bring them to America. So he paid for his ticket and got on the steamship and headed for America. Of course, it's a several week trip. And, uh, but he wanted to save as much money as he could to get his start in America. And so he, he um, for food, he bought a big horn of cheese and some crackers. And every day he would, he would go to his stateroom and he'd slice off some cheese and some crackers. And he had to ration it out so that it was just enough to get him to America. And every day he would, he would see uh, at certain times of the day, the rest of the passengers would go to the dining hall. And uh, he'd go by the window and look in the window and he'd see they were sitting there to nice, abundant uh, meals. And, but he went to back to his stateroom and he had, he had his cheese and crackers. Finally, they were about to New York. They were about to enter the harbor and go by the Statue of Liberty and and uh, he was so looking forward to that. And he, he got down to, he laid his very last cheese and crackers. And he was, he was so hungry as he walked by the stateroom once again. And his tummy was growling as he heard the, the um, or as he watched them eat their meal. So he's standing up on the, on the deck of the ship. And he's watching out, watching for the Statue of Liberty. And and as, he's, as they're sailing along, there's a, a porter standing beside him. And, and the porter said to him, Sir, I've, I've noticed throughout this trip that, that uh, you never came to the, to the dining hall. You just, you always went back to your stateroom to eat. And, and he said, yeah. He said, you know, he said, uh, I was trying to save my money because we need to uh, get established in, in America. And I didn't have enough money to buy the food for the trip and so forth. And, and the porter said, uh, sir, don't you understand? The food was all paid for in the price of your ticket. Every day we set a plate for you and you never came. Isn't that how people are? Jesus gave. God gave. But people don't reach out and take it people don't accept it it's still there it's still all there all the time for everyone but people don't reach out and take it so what was it that he gave number five his one and only son his one and only son the most precious thing he had you know, God owns the universe. There's a lot of things he could have given. Um, <laughs> he could have given us sunshine all the time, right? Summer all the time. 
He could have taken away all pain and suffering. He could have given us anything, but he, he chose to give us the most precious thing he had, his son. Luke 2 says, Mary took her firstborn son. She had other sons, but this was her firstborn son. Luke 2 says, the angel said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the only Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. The Son of God. Mary had other sons. Jesus was the only one that was God's son. He was God's son. The others were Joseph's sons. God chose to give that son his one and only son. So who was he going to give it to? He says that whoever. Whoever. It doesn't say the ones I choose. It doesn't say it's just going to be the Baptists or it's just going to be the Methodists or the Presbyterians or the Amish or the Mennonites or the Catholics. It's not just going to be that certain group of people. It's going to be whoever, whoever. It's not specific to gender or race. He says whoever, whoever. You know, when Peter had his vision that God had given him of the... the um, because up to that point, he thought, he thought salvation was just for the Jews, that Jesus just came for the Jewish people. But God gave him a vision of the sheet coming down from heaven, all these unclean animals in it. And God told him, this is now good for everybody, for the Gentiles. And Peter said this, he said, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. Whoever, he says, whoever. What's the criteria? The criteria is believes in him. Believes in him. You know, sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we tend to say, well, there's got to be more to it than that. There's got to be, got to be something else. 1 John 5, 5 says, Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is is the Son of God. Now what is belief really? If we think about what belief is, belief, belief is faith, right? I cannot prove to you that Jesus came and died and rose again. I wasn't there, okay? But I believe it. And because I believe it, it causes me to act a certain way. See, if you truly believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, he lived, he died on the cross, he rose on the third day, and today he's sitting at the right hand of God, interceding for us. If you truly believe that, it will cause you to act a certain way. It will cause you to read the things that Jesus said, and it will cause you to do the things that, that, that Jesus teaches us to do. See, here's a big misconception about Christianity today. Many believe that Christians do good deeds to win favor with God. That's not what it is. You already have favor with God. We do good deeds because we believe. We do good deeds out of gratitude and as a tool to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. Some of you were involved on Christmas night in, in serving Christmas dinners to people that maybe didn't have uh, family or didn't have any place else to go. And so I forget, there was probably what, 50, um, 40 to 50 people that, um, that we served here. And uh, God bless you for that. Why do we do that? Do we do that to win favor with God? No, we do that because we already have favor with God. We do that to spread the love to, to people around us. In the refugee camps in Syria and Iraq, Muslims are coming to Christ. Why? I just, I just got an article this week in uh, a ministry that's, that's raising money to send a million Bibles into those refugee camps. Why? Because Christians are going into these refugee camps and are serving the Muslims in those camps. The Muslims are saying, what's going on here? Our Muslim brothers aren't coming to help us, but these Christians are. Maybe we should read what's in, those, in their book. And they're starting to read what is in the book and they're starting to become saved. 
And many, many, many people are becoming saved because of what the Christians are doing. Amen. Praise God for that. That's why we do that. James 2.18 says, But someone will say, You have faith, I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. We show our faith by what we do. So we believe. Believe in him. Whoever believes in him. Number eight, will not perish. Will not perish. You know, every person who's ever lived since Adam and Eve since they gave in to that temptation in the Garden of Eden, has been condemned to perish an eternal death, better known as hell. Now, I know a lot of people don't like to talk about that. They don't like to use that word. But you'll never appreciate the value of what Jesus gave, the value of that gift, until you understand the terribleness of hell. Jesus said, Jesus said it was so important that you not go to that place. He said, this is so important that if your hand is causing you to sin, he said, cut it off. He says, it's better to you, for you to go to heaven without your hand than to go to hell with it. He said, if, if your foot is leading you astray, he said, cut it off. Because it's better for you to go to heaven without your foot than to go to hell with your foot. He said, if your eye is causing you to sin, pluck it out because it is better for you to go to heaven without your eye than it is to go to hell with your eye. And then he says, in hell, he describes it this way, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Psalm 917 says, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. All the nations that forget God. <sighs> Jesus said it himself. Unless you repent, you too will perish. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish. That's what he was talking about. Shall not go to hell shall not have that judgment. That judgment, that day of reckoning is coming for all of us. Life on earth is just the warm-up act. It's just the warm-up act for eternity. And what you do on earth, what you do with this verse, determines where you wind up. John 3.18 says, Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Okay, so the whole world is condemned unless they believe in Jesus. Unless they believe in Jesus. You say, that's all there is? Yep, that's all there is. Now next Sunday, it's the beginning of the year, right? And... Um, a lot of times at the beginning of the year, I kind of do a message on kind of the state of the church or, or um, you know, what I see coming for the next year or, or so forth. And, and uh, so next Sunday, I'm going to do something, um, well, maybe a little bit different, but still kind of like that. Um, I think the title of my message next, next Sunday is going to be The Rise of the Spirit of Antichrist. 1 John 4, 3 says, But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist. The spirit of Antichrist. I'm going to show how that spirit is creeping into our churches even. And um, it's, it's kind of a hard-hitting message. You don't want to miss it. But, um, you know, God has, has laid this on my heart and it's, it's, a, it's a spiritual warfare thing. There's a, there's a war going on. Not a physical war. There's a spiritual war going on. And if we don't wake up, we're going to lose it. And we've got we to gotta wake up. So be praying for me this week as I put that to, together because uh, Satan don't like to be exposed. He don't like to be exposed. And he's going to come at us with everything he's got. But um, so remember that this week. So we'll not perish, but there's good news but have eternal life. Eternal life. You know, this gift 
that God gives you is eternal. How many of you have gotten gifts and, you know, especially kids, <laughs> by the end of the day, Christmas Day, they're broken. <laughs> they're in the trash. They might last a week or a month, but they're temporary, right? They're temporary. It, over time, they're, they become worthless. But this gift is eternal. Not a year, not five years, not ten years, not a hundred years, not a thousand years. Eternal life. Eternal life. And not life like we experience it here. Here we have pain, we have sorrow, we have heartache, we have struggles, we have misery. It's not that kind of life. It's a life with eternal bliss with God. With God and his son and the angels forever. Remember when I talked about the Samaritan woman. Jesus told the Samaritan woman, he says, if you will ask me, if you will just ask me, I will give you the water of life. And you will never thirst again. Never thirst again. Imagine that. We can go to the book of Revelation and we can see it's referred to again in the book of Revelation. It says, The Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let the one who hears say, Come. Let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who wishes take the free gift of the water of life. That, my friends, is the story of Christmas. That is the greatest gift ever. The greatest gift ever is that gift of the water of life. And I can say with Paul when he said in 2 Corinthians, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. You know, I tried to describe it this morning, but I'm frustrated because I can't do it justice. There's just no way to do it justice to describe this gift, this free gift that God has given to every person on planet Earth. If we're not like the guy on the steamship, if we'll reach out and we'll take it. Reach out and we'll take it. And now many of us have taken that. And now it's our responsibility. It's our responsibility to help others with that gift as well. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Let's stand for prayer. Father, we, uh, we thank you this morning for your indescribable gift. We thank you that you sent your son into our world so that we can go free, so that we can have our sins forgiven, so that we can have the promise of eternal life, so that we do not have to perish but we can be redeemed and we can have that hope of salvation, that hope of eternal life with you. God, we are so thankful and so grateful for that today. God, if there's anybody here this morning that has not reached out and grasped that gift yet, they're, eating, they're still eating their cheese and crackers. They're not, they're not having the banquet yet. Father, I just pray that they'd give their life to you today. And it's real simple. It's just by believing like your word says. And just praying, Father, forgive me. I believe you. I believe in your gift of Jesus Christ. Please come forgive my sins. And I want to live for you. Father, I lift this day up to you. Pray that you'd be with each one as they uh, maybe continue with family and uh, so forth throughout the holidays. Pray that it would be a great time of uh, reconnecting and a time of just uh, sharing with the people that they love and care about. We just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.